Bitcoin is final money. It's uh, the last form of money humanity will ever need for as long as we need money. The entire economic system that we have right now is not geared towards production. It's geared towards uh, zombie corporations and uh, short-term uh, gains and just consumers. Everything that is wrong with the world today stems from the fact that we are living in a fiat system. Bitcoin could be the exact opposite of what we want it to be if we are not careful and take privacy uh, very, very seriously. Bitcoin will always exist as the discussion discovery of absolute mathematical scarcity. It's pretty incredible to have front row seats to the greatest economic transformation in the history of our species. And I don't say that lightly because we're also simultaneously, we have front row seats to the greatest civilizational collapse in the history of our species. When you don't have good money, society doesn't work. We are now living through the financial dark ages. We have broken money that is used as a surveillance tool. We cannot be in a worse place. Having weak money makes us weak because it undermines our potential to coordinate and collaborate to the best of our ability. There is an ongoing war on privacy. Perhaps the most important war in Bitcoin's history it makes the block size wars look like a snowball fight. It's so fascinating. I use when I explain Bitcoin and the essence of having sound money, I usually use doctors as an example, because if you have uh, a, a sound money, it's amazing. You can just like do your job and save in your sound money and you don't have to be a portfolio manager on the side. And you usually right. like if you are on a day job and you are saving lives during the day, you don't want to have being a portfolio manager when you come home because saving lives and, and being a doctor and whatever you're doing in the medical uh, scenes uh, is enough already. And I, I, it's so funny because I never spoke to a doctor on, on my podcast, but I use doctor quite often as, as an example oh, for that. There's a first for everything. Yeah. So this is the idea popularized by Safedine. Uh, in in uh, the Bitcoin standard, uh, because it's really is symptomatic of uh, a broken economy when someone who has an education, like a doctor or or if you're a lawyer or whatever it is, uh, something that took uh, five, six, seven years of school and then years of practice, and then you still have to to either gamble on the market or or become an investment. Um, you have to be knowledgeable uh, in in investing and that's just not it's not doable it speaks to the state of the economy more than anything else absolutely yeah. and you wrote a book uh, i think the, the the title in itself is is, is amazing abundance through scarcity it's a good uh, title I, I, I love it a lot. Like uh, it's, it's. I think you're the first title. I, I, I was like, why didn't that, nobody thought about that title before? It's a, it's an amazing title. Um, but the, the question that uh, comes up, uh, I think that's the, the main question you want to answer in the book, is like, why does that fixed money, scarce money, uh, give us an abundant life on, on an individual level or, or even like on a society level? Well, this is uh, the premise of the entire book, uh, and takes you from the fall of the Roman Empire and into the future and looks at how the different states of the economy has, how the economy has evolved over uh, since the Roman Empire and up to today from the denarius to uh, commodity money of different kinds and into the uh, gold standard, into the fiat economy and then into Bitcoin. And it's pretty clear that when money is cheap and abundant, then everything else is going to be scarce. And this is the uh, this is essentially the Jeff Booth price of tomorrow thesis that the economy should inherently be deflationary, but it can only be if money is hard. And because if we keep expanding the monetary supply, it will um, we will have. Uh, more and more dollars chase, chasing the same amount of goods. And that's the, there is no production in that. The, uh, the entire economic system that we have right now is geared, uh, it's not geared towards production, it's geared towards um, uh, zombie corporations and, and uh, short term um, gains and just consumerism. Absolutely. That, yeah, and in order to escape that whole system, the, I mean, it, it's everything that we see, uh, everything that we have, everything that is wrong with the world today stems from the fact that we are living in a fiat system. And the Bitcoin is basically the reverse of that. It's uh, just getting away from cheap money, 
which will change uh, our culture, our minds, our uh, how how we act in the world. Uh, it will change everything. So this this is the central thesis of the book. Mm. Yeah, I, I love that that thesis. Uh, it's really cool that there is like this underlying fundamental basis of our lives, which is like money, because we use it to to exchange energy, basically. Mm. Uh, and when we exchange that, and it's not something that um, losing value or stealing value better. Uh, I, I like I like to pronounce it more like stealing value, not losing value. Um, but it, it gives us actually energy over time, which is an amazing concept. Uh, and it's it's hard for people that uh, are so used to fear to like gra grab like oh like, there can actually be money that uh, doesn't devalue. I think that concept is especially for people that haven't been in the Bitcoin space and that haven't mm -hmm. been. Uh, down the rabbit hole of sound money really hard. I, I know people that have studied economics, or even entrepreneurs, who are like, yeah, we need uh, inflation to trigger the economy, we trigger, uh, trigger growth and stuff like that. That, that. that thought is so deep in in our society. In hand. It's, It sometimes fascinates me uh, how uh, we, we can actually think that uh, a central authority stealing our purchasing power is good for uh, the economy somehow. It's It's... It's backwards. We we got the economy entirely backwards. It has become something that it shouldn't be. Like just some basic concept about the economy uh, that that are like to normies <laughs> seem uh, seem uh, normal, but it's it's like it's really strange how strange our economy is. For example, uh, just a thought I had just an hour ago, like. Uh, you know how the, like the physical counterpart of a digital fiat currency is a feature, not a bug. But the non-existence of a physical counterpart in Bitcoin is also a feature, not a bug. And the reason for this dichotomy is that Bitcoin is decentralized and censorship resistant by design. And the only way to avoid surveillance and the risk of censorship in a centralized authoritarian monetary system like the fiat system is with cash. But we don't have that. Cash does not exist. Uh, like here, here in Sweden, for example, the, the uh, entire the fiat economy is, in, is completely digitized and that's where it's going. So money originally had three functions, right? It, it's supposed to be a store value, a medium of exchange, and a unit of account. But recently, as Andreas Antonopoulos popularized also, the uh, uh, it gained a fourth function, and that is financial surveillance. So uh, that was some that was something that was always inherent in in the in a centralized economy. So, uh, but and and fiat money isn't really cash. Also, uh, I think that it's an important distinction to make. We call Bitcoin digital cash because because it is it's cyber cash, a term that I'm remind, uh, romanticizing more than digital cash, cyber cash. Cash is a form of money. It's a form of money. Cash is a form of money that's that's universally as accepted as a medium of exchange and whose function is to settle debt immediately. So technically, fiat money isn't cash. Fiat cash isn't cash because it doesn't settle debt. So when when you and I tr transact in fiat, we're just letting debt shift hands. So we're never actually settling anything. We're just moving debt around. So And that's because fiat is a currency. It's not money. You can't settle debt with a currency. Uh, you can't settle debt with debt. So you need money to settle debt. That's what money does. Money is an extinguisher of debt. And Bitcoin is money. Bitcoin is also cash because it settles debt immediately upon transactions. So, and there's really nothing. There's there's really nothing exciting about this. This is just how it should always have been. But our monetary technology, the fiat system, got so got corrupted along the way, and mutated into this disfigured beast that is the fiat system. So Bitcoin in a way is just a way back to normal, just a way to back yes. to normal life. Yes, exactly. It's just back to normal. That's exactly what Bitcoin is. That's a that's an interesting 
think I never thought about that. Like I always thought like it's the evolution of money. It's some a progress of money, but it's actually like just, <laughs> just going back to a, a normal sense. It's, go, it's, it's vanishing the virus out of the system and uh, going back to a normal state. Uh, I love yeah, the way the fiat currencies, uh, the fiat system, the entire fiat system was, I, it, it gets ba a bad rep, but it was absolutely necessary. The reason the fiat system came about in the first place and the reason um, was because we were globalizing the economy. We couldn't use gold because gold is hard and expensive to transfer. It's slow, essentially. And we needed less money with less friction in a globalized economy. And that's where the fiat system was born. And it has served us incredibly well up until now. Now the world has evolved past the fiat system. And as the world has evolved past the fiat system, it's like we, it's like fiat were these rocket boosters that brought us to a certain altitude. And then now it's time to, dro to drop those rocket boosters because now we're in the actual spaceship, which is Bitcoin. And uh, Bitcoin, I have argued this multiple times, is final money. It's uh, the last form of money humanity will ever need for as long as we need money. Even like in, in, in thousands and hundreds of thousands of years, the, 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 there will always be, be Bitcoin? That is how I see it. Um, because what Bitcoin is, like, here, here's the thing. What we have to make the distinct distinction between Bitcoin and the ecosystem of Bitcoin. So what Bitcoin is at the most fundamental level is the discovery of absolute mathematical scarcity. And that will always be underneath the actual uh, ecosystem. But then we will build, you know, uh, wallets and have the network and all of these things. And and it uh, that layer, the entire ecosystem can, we can mess that up. We can mess that up. And I think we are at a very critical time in Bitcoin's history where we are right now battling the most important war in Bitcoin's history, which is the, the battle of the right to privacy. Because privacy is not baked in into the base layer. It is, and it's not something that we should even have to ask. It's something that we're born with. We are born with our right uh, to privacy. It's just something that is inherent. It's something that, that we have as human beings. It's not something that can be given to us. It can't be given to you. It's just something that you are born with, the right to privacy. It's like your right to your consciousness uh, or the right to your body. It's not something that the government or anybody else can give to you. They can only take it away from you, and they do, but there's no such thing as giving people rights. There's only such a thing as taking rights away from people. And we are right now at this crossroads with Bitcoin where there's the, the, uh, the war for for privacy technology. And there's this big government clampdown on privacy technology, as we saw with the Samurai uh, wallet, and now also with um, Duro, um, Paulo Duro, uh, the Telegram CEO. So this is, uh, it's, a, it's a sad state of affairs that we're in currently, but this is just our current iteration of the Bitcoin ecosystem that is undergoing this this uh, transformation, this evolution. I think that we will come out, out on top. I think the cypherpunks will uh, eventually prevail because they are cypherpunks and you don't bet against them. But we could also see the, uh, the case where the entire Bitcoin ecosystem is essentially captured, corrupted, hijacked by a state, by the state and used for a massive Orwellian dystopian surveillance tool. Bitcoin could be the exact opposite of what we want it to be if we are not careful and take privacy uh, very, very seriously. And we are right now in the midst of this war and we, we could lose this battle, uh, in which case Bitcoin could become uh, the worst thing to ever happen to humanity. Mm. But we are 
uh, th this is only the ecosystem of Bitcoin. Bitcoin will always exist as the discovery of mathematical, absolute mathematical scarcity. It's like a new fundamental constant in the universe that we have discovered, uh, like zero. It's, uh, it's even more important than zero. It's absolute mathematical scarcity in cyberspace. This has never existed before. It's never going to exist again in some other forms. It's just, it is. It's, you, you don't discover uh, the speed of light twice. There's not going to be another speed of light. And there's not going to be another absolute mathematical scarcity of Bitcoin. Um, and on top of this discovery, we've built the Bitcoin network. And we can, in if, if this iteration of the, the ecosystem turns out to be too fragile and it's hijacked by the state and it becomes this dystopian or well in uh, or well in dystopian surveillance tool then in 300 years 400 years a thousand years absolute mathematical scarcity will still be there available for us to rebuild a new ecosystem much like the spark of humanity didn't disappear with the fall of rome or with, uh, with the fall of any empire or civilization. We rebuild. That's what we do. And, we be, and we're better each time. So you're saying uh, there's a chance that Bitcoin's ecosystem gets captured, but not Bitcoin itself. Uh, yeah, Bitcoin is uncapturable. Like, yeah. how, how are you... Until we are like a, a, like a Kardashev type 4 type of a civilization that can actually manipulate the the fundamental laws of the universe, we are not going to, to be able to uh, uh, change Bitcoin. Bitcoin is, it's like the, you're not going to manipulate the number zero. You're not going to manipulate the speed of light. You're not going to manipulate. I like that. I also feel it. I also see it, see it like that. It's also crazy. Um, when you think about that, Bitcoin actually could be there for hundreds and thousands of years uh, and, and, basically till 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 the end <laughs> yeah. uh, whatever this is it's fine uh, money uh, it's 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 fascinating to think that we actually live through the time where bitcoin wasn't existing and it was not there uh and then it's it's here or or do you see bitcoin was always already always here and we just discovered it like yeah, B bitcoin was always here it just had an infinitely low hash rate uh, so 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 we discovered it then yeah um Exactly. We, uh, Bitcoin is, is the discovery of absolute mathematical scarcity and how we implement, implement it uh, is up to you. Uh, but it's the discovery of absolute mathematical scarcity. And uh, if an alien civilization uh, discover absolute mathematical scarcity in the digital world as well, uh, they could you do something else with it. We, we are using it. We are calling it Bitcoin and we are building an economic operating system on it. Uh, We're building the new world economy, an entire economic operating system and and I cannot stress how incredible it is to uh, have a second, a new economic operating system. Um, people don't fathom how, how deeply this impacts the world. Uh, I mean, the world as we perceive it is essentially the economy. And we have a new, entirely new economic operating system, which is just a, a fascinating, fascinating idea. How different, I mean, let me ask you this way, how, when we have now a world that has Bitcoin discovered already, uh, but only a small portion of the world actually knows about Bitcoin and how, how powerful it is, mm -hmm. um, what changes when everyone knows how powerful it is and it is normal as air and it's normal as as now fear and money is normal um what what does this change how does this abundance uh, uh look like uh, if, if we come to that state i'm very optimistic by nature i look forward to the future but i can't predict the future in any way i'm not going to pretend to i don't know what a, what a bitcoinized like a hyper bitcoinized future looks like it is already a bitcoinized economy and we are undergoing hyper bitcoinization as we speak i cannot foresee the downstream effects of this uh, nobody can we can pretend to and we can make all kinds of cool sci-fi scenarios uh, from it but what i do say uh, will say is that it's pretty incredible to have front row seats to the greatest economic transformation in the history of our species. And I don't say that lightly. We are, because we're also simultaneously, we are, we have 
front row seats to the greatest civilizational collapse in the history of our species. We have been on a civilizational decline since the 1970s, since the 1970s. Uh, so 50 years we've been declining and civilizations naturally ebb and flow uh, through, through declines and progress. Declines are sometimes severe and sometimes very dangerous because they can lead to collapse and they have many times throughout history. There's always some kind of, like when an economy naturally declines, which, which we have since the 1970s, we see this uh, because we all have, um, we all have a smaller claim on the economy compared to like our grandparents, for, for instance. Like when, when my grandparents were younger than me, they could live on one income, have four kids, a car, go on vacation once a year, save some money for the future, and do all that on one income. Today, you need two incomes to live in an apartment uh, and have a pet. I mean, the, 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 it's ridiculous. We have more technology, but we are, uh, our living standards are comparatively lower. And that is, uh, that is because the money is broken. Uh, sorry, I, I went on a tangent. What was your question? What were we talking about? I, I was, uh, asking, uh, how, how about the conversation uh, will uh, look yeah, like? Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. We are right now we have front row seats to the end of civilization, which is a fascinating place to be. And it's epic. We have been in a decline since the 1970s. And this time, this decline could lead to collapse. But when, what we see in previous empires that have collapsed is that there's a convergence of war, pandemics, and broken money. It's a trifecta. And when you don't have good money, society doesn't work. You, we need money to coordinate our resources and our workforce and to collaborate across distances and time. Money really is a fascinating, magical technology. It lets us coordinate our global workforce and our global resources. And it lets us coordinate our efforts across distances and generations, which is, uh, which is fascinating. And I mean, when money fails in an economy, their coordination is gonna falter. And the complexity within that society is gonna collapse to the level that can be sustained by the amount of coordination that is permitted by the money. So there's sort of a direct correlation between how hard the money is and how well functioning it is and the comple complexity of society that it can sustain. Meaning that if you have good money, hard money, infinitely hard money, which Bitcoin is, it's infinitely hard. There's nothing else that can ever be harder. There's 21 million uh, Bitcoins. And it's, uh, it's, there's no friction in, in when we transact. So uh, it's frictionless, it's infinitely hard, and it's immortal. This allows for uh, human creativity and, and it allows for humanity to really flourish, to, to uh, become what we can with, with the fiat system. We have to fight against ourselves, our, our inner demons, uh, our, uh, our greed, our, the hate we have towards ourselves. But Bitcoin gives us an environment where we can really flourish as a, as a species. Infinitely hard money. When money is truly scarce, and not just scarce, it's fixed. That means that we can optimize our coordination and collaboration across distance and time without uh, needless and pointless distractions and like zombie corporations and cheap credit and, and uh, high time preference uh, behavior. It means that we can truly flourish as a species in that kind of environment. And there are all kinds of 
all kinds of futures we can imagine uh, going forward in a Bitcoinized economy. And I'm sure that all of them will be uh, pretty great. It's fascinating because it seems like we... <laughs> It seems like the fiat system we're in is like the kind of the dark ages, uh, and 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 Bitcoin is 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 this like small orange light that uh, guides us out. Like that was kind of the the picture that I got when when we were talking about the fiat system and 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 the Bitcoin system that we are going towards. Uh, I, I like the comparison a lot and how you, how you put it. Really really cool. Um, one thing. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that I think you're spot on that we are now living through the financial dark ages. We have broken money that is used as a surveillance tool. Uh, we cannot be in a worse place with this uh, current economic operating system. So, uh, you know, it, it really it really gives you hope about the future when we have something like Bitcoin, where we we can get rid of all of like the worst of humanity, which is found in the fiat system. One extremely fundamental thing uh, when you think about money is time. Time and money and energy, the are like those, the three things are kind of all interconnected. Uh, and I also ask every guest of mine uh, um, what, what topics they want to speak about. I think one of, I think the first one actually you wrote back to me was time, uh, mm -hmm. which is also fascinating. Um, how has Bitcoin changed your perception or your meaning of, of, of time? I'm not sure that Bitcoin has changed a lot for me when it comes to time. Well, it it has, it has lowered my time preference, uh, but that sort of feels trivial after a few years. But I guess it's not. Like if you talk to a normie uh, with high time preference, so I mean that it, it's it's just an, a personal transformation that we should all undergo. We go back to what is inherently true about ourselves, and as a, as human beings, we have a, a natural short time preference um we have a long time horizon we look deep into the future if we are permitted to but the fiat system disallows it so uh, bitcoin is just going back to normal it, it allows us again to think about the future and plan for the future but uh, i think what uh, what changes um there are a lot of things that have changed for me recently like with regards to how i look at reality and time um I'm not sure on what end to start here because I think we could have, we could go down a rabbit hole of time and quantum mechanics possibly. Let's do it. Should we do it? Yeah, I have like uh, I don't know what uh, quantum mechanics and and time have have together. So like I I definitely learned something new. All right. Uh, uh, oh, actually, I'm okay. Let me show you. I'm reading this book right now. Something Deeply Hidden by physicist Sean Carroll. It's um, a fascinating read. It's a fascinating read. It's a bit mathy, uh, and there's a lot of physics in it. But if you can stomach that, it's um, it says something quite profound about our reality. So this is something that has like fundamentally changed how I look at reality. And this is really fascinating. So there are essentially two interpretations of quantum mechanics. How the universe how the universe works at a fundamental level. There are two schools of thought. There's the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, and then there are, then there's the many worlds interpretation. And they're both equally fascinating, and they're both equally terrifying. Both of these realities shake me to my core, and I'm not being dramatic here. Well, I am, but if you contemplate deeply the implications of these two realities, it changes your relationship with the reality because it changes the nature of reality. And what can be more fascinating and terrifying? So to understand these ideas, uh, these two realities that we, these two theories about reality, you have to know just very superficially what quantum mechanics is and what is meant by the term superposition. And this is not complicated at all. I mean, it's the most complicated thing in the world, but uh, just the definitions are not that hard to grasp. So quantum mechanics is just a branch of physics and it is our best understanding of the universe. And it's not, it's not an approximation of the universe. It, it is the universe. And what is meant by the term uh, superposition. Well, sorry, let me go back. Uh, uh, the quantum mechanics, uh, what it does, what it says is that um, it describes uh, particles and events uh, as existing in superpositions and uh, behaving probabilistically. And superposition means that something is in, in uh, 
two states or two places at the same time, which is very, very counterintuitive to us human beings. But the universe is in no obligation to make sense to us. So the cat can be dead and alive at the same time. Actually, it is. Uh, it's both both things at once. It's just this is just very counterintuitive to um, the quantum universe. is very counterintuitive to the human brain, but it is what it is, and this has implications for reality. So first, the Copenhagen interpretation says that some it says something truly fascinating about quantum mechanics. It says this: uh, quantum mechanics says that the universe exists in a superposition of possible states. Another way to say this is this is that the universe is a wave function. Wave functions describe the probability of where a particle might be or what state it might be in at any given time. Okay, so but when we make an observation of that particle that's in a superposition, like every particle always is, uh, a particle is in a superposition until it is observed, because when we observe it, we collapse the wave function, meaning we force it to be in a determined state. And it's no longer in this mystical two states at once quantum state. In other words, by looking at the particle, we force the universe to make a decision to be in one of the two states. And here's the fascinating part. The entire universe is a quantum system. It's one wave function. And the wave function of the universe uh, exists in a superposition of possible states. So uh, take an electron. An electron can be spin up or spin down along a, a vertical axis. Uh, but when observed, the two possible it, it, it is uh, both spin up and spin down, as it should say. It's uh, in a superposition until it is observed. But the two possibilities of spin up and spin down collapse into one outcome, either spin up or spin down when we observe it. And this means that the universe, this means that the universe, so it means that the universe is created as we observe it. The implications of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics is that you are creating reality as you go, simply by observing and being conscious of it, because that is how you collapse the superposition of the wave function, uh, function of the universe. And this gives me goosebumps. This means that reality doesn't really fully exist in a definitive state until it is observed. Before any observation is made, particles and the entire universe are in a superposition of all possible outcomes. And we only force it into a definitive state the moment we observe it. So our consciousness creates reality by being conscious of reality. That is the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, and it's fascinating. And <laughs> if you think that the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics is fascinating, wait until you hear the many worlds interpretation. And Sean Carroll, in uh, something deeply hidden, this book, he um, is a proponent of the many worlds theory. And this is even more fa fascinating and terrifying. On the Copenhagen side, we have that we create reality as we go along by collapsing the, the superposition of the universe's wave function. And it's my understanding that that sounds like the more, <laughs> that actually sounds like the more sober um, interpretation of quantum mechanics, but uh, more physicists, I believe, are actually leaning towards the many worlds interpretation. And I'm no physicist, but I can be scared by physics just the same. <laughs> And I lean towards the many worlds interpretation as well. So the many worlds interpretation says that instead of collapsing into one reality uh, when we observe something, all possible outcomes actually happen, meaning that the universe splits into different branches, one for each outcome. So you flip a coin and in one branch of the universe, it lands heads and uh, and you decide to ask the girl out. In this version of reality, you get to be happy. In another branch of the universe, the coin lands tails and you decide to stay at home. And uh, you have a comfortable evening on your couch watching Netflix. Here's the disturbing part. These two branches, they both exist physically. They don't interact, they can't interact, uh, but they're equally real. And they exist in 
parallel universes. And parallel here is a is a very it's a challenging concept for the human brain to grasp. But in the uh, many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, there's no need to collapse the wave function. There's a lot of criticism against the Copenhagen interpretation because like, what is an observer really? Um, can, can a machine be an observer? Does it have to be conscious? What is an observer? Something has to observe the wave function for it to collapse. We know that, but so, and what is an observer? But the entire universe is quantum. It's not just an approximation of the universe like uh, classical physics. The quantum mechanics actually is what the universe is. And the universe remains in a superposition of all possible outcomes at all time. Each quantum event, like a coin toss, like you make a coin toss, it can land heads or tails. When you make that coin toss, it causes the universe to branch with both possible outcomes happening in its own version of reality. Uh, there's going to be one where it lands tails and another one where it lands heads. Both are equally real. So instead of us people collapsing the universe into a single outcome by observing it as uh, in accordance to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, the universe splits into different branches where different versions of you exist in those different realities. Uh, and these other versions, versions are inaccessible. They are parallel. They are simultaneous. They are uh, inaccessible. They are they are as real as reality you experience. But they are they're not. It's not like they are. This means that there are two possibilities. We have the Copenhagen and we have the many worlds. Either we create the universe by observing and experiencing it, or the universe splits into several branches branches moment by moment where those other worlds are equally real, but they don't like exist in space somewhere, uh, but they exist in parallel to our own reality in an inaccessible quantum reality. And this has fundamentally changed how I look at reality. And I think that the cognitive horizon of human beings is challenged by quantum mechanics. And, and I'm not sure we will ever be able to understand uh, it's more than mathematically. We either don't have the hardware or the software or both to grasp the nature of reality intuitively. And I, I just think that this is, um, it's uh, fascinating and terrifying that these two, these are the two best interpretations of reality as we know them. It looks like either we create reality as we go along, or there are infinite numbers, um, versions equally real, someplace parallel that, that are inaccessible to us. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit Bitbox dot swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual you have to have the most secure self-custody setup you have to secure your own devices you have to protect your privacy you have to set up an inheritance plan and depending on where you live you even want to have a plan b a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really really wrong and through all those steps the Bitcoin Way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an 
and perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. That is that is fascinating. Yeah, and I, I actually never looked looked into that. I I heard the the words uh, already before um, in in series and movies and stuff like that, uh, but I never really looked into quantum mechanics like that. It's it's fascinating to uh, to understand that now like, a little well, bit. We all just want deeper experiences, right? Uh, and there there are many ways to have deep experiences. Uh, I I think that understanding reality is one of the best ways to experience it more deeply. If you and the best way to get to like um like a more fundamental uh, like an uh, um a deeper understanding of the fundamental nature of reality. You first of all need to observe it, which you can do through meditation and you can have a have some help with psychedelics here. But to also understand it physically and mathematical, mathematically, um, even if you don't understand the math, if you don't speak that language, I don't speak math beyond like high school or, or some basic university math. Uh, I don't speak math like the physicists do but you can still understand the implications of their of their work by analogy that can lead to some i think for me that is the best way to have a deeper experience of reality i've been spending a lot of time in nature uh lately i'm in love with it uh, i'm mesmerized by it i love the beauty and I love the technology of nature. I think nature is a great place to have some of the deep, deeper experiences. And I've been contemplating like how human, how arrogant we human beings can be sometimes. Like we, how we think that we are so technologically superior to anything else that has existed beside, uh, besides us. But if we compare nature's technology to our own technology, if we were to make that distinction, it's, it can be argued that you can't really make that distinction because um, the technology that we create is nature as well. But like, if we make that distinction for argument's sake, that uh, there's technology that nature has created and there's technology that we have created, we are lagging behind. <laughs> The technology created by man by no means compete with the technology of nature. Like, we are nowhere near the sophistication of nature. And thinking otherwise would only prove our arrogance as uh, as human beings. And here, here, here's a, okay, so a few examples. Like, here's what nature can do. Nature builds self-replicating. Uh, we have never built anything that's self-replicating. But nature builds self-replicating conscious machines that last for hundreds of years in, in human beings. Nature has created us. And I think we are nature's magnum opus. Uh, so that's where, where I'll start flexing on nature's behalf. Uh, it created humans. Uh, so which... everything that humans create basically also created nature because nature created humans. Yeah, exactly. And that's the distinction I want to make. Um, that's what I said that, that I want, if for argument's sake, we can just, uh, if we want to marvel at nature's technology, I think it can be beneficial to compare it to human technology because we understand, we have an intuitive grasp for our own technology, but we, we don't really appreciate how sophisticated nature's technology truly is, but nature can actually create self-replicating conscious machines. Uh, we can't create anything that's self-replicating, let alone conscious, but nature has other cool tech as well. Like take biological memory, for example. Nature doesn't use uh, papyrus or hard drives to pre preserve information. It uses DNA. And DNA lasts for eons. DNA has preserved information like, uh, like uh, the, the blueprint for ion channels for billions of years. So we have nothing 
that comes close to preserving information over any time that even compares to what nature can do. Like the best we have done is to to build things out of stone and to carve things into stone. But that deteriorates over thousands to um, a couple of million years. We have actually now um, found a way to preserve information over longer periods of time. For example, we have sent the Voyager craft into deep space. And that craft, those craft contain the gold record with photos, music, and a, a small library of human knowledge. And we sent that in, out into the cosmos, kind of like a monument to humanity or a tombstone, if you want a darker look at it. Um, and that, those spacecraft, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, sent out in, in 1973, I think, they, they are going to sail the cosmic oceans for billions of years intact. So now we actually found a way to preserve information over long periods of time, but like it's not as dynamic as DNA. And nature has other, uh, has uh, more cool technologies, like um, a third extremely cool technology that that uh, nature has that we can't compete with by any stretch of the imagination is uh, photosynthesis. And you know what makes uh, photosynthesis so cool? Like, are you familiar with the concept? Yeah, I mean, uh, the from from the sun you get the, get the energy and and then it, it grows. That's basically what what I yeah. know about it. <laughs> Absolutely, it's it's what has brought life to this planet essentially. And what makes it so cool is that it's a quantum mechanical computation at room temperature. Let me explain. <laughs> like we have no idea what photosynthesis is or like how it works. We can observe the molecules and we can see what they do, but how they actually do what they do is far beyond the gra grasp of any human. So, uh, like, if you look at photosynthesis, like, take a plant, there's this uh, light harvesting molecule in the plant. Uh, it absorbs sunlight, and that absorbed energy, hear this, is in a superposition. So, that energy, uh, the light harvesting complex absorbs the energy of light and that energy is in a superposition which means that it is exploring uh it, it is in a superposition uh in the sense that it explores multiple paths simultaneously uh allowing the plant to find the most efficient route for that stored energy to the reaction center without losing energy essentially performing a quantum computation to optimize the energy transfer from, from the light harvesting complex to the center of the, uh, where, where the energy is going to be used. Uh, it explores multiple paths at once. And that is a quantum computation. And it does this at room temperature. That is the most fascinating thing. Um, because remember, for us humans, to do even simple calculations with a quantum computer, we need to keep it at around minus 273.135 degrees Celsius, which is uh, around 2.7 Kelvin. Uh, and the reason we need to keep it so cold is to prevent something called decoherence. Uh, decoherence is when uh, qubits lose their quantum properties and start acting like a regular object. Qubits are the bits of the quantum computers, like tradi traditional computers are made of transi transistors, which can be either on or off, one or zero. One is a bit, zero is a bit. So regular computers work with bits. Uh, but in quantum computers, um, the bit is a qubit. So instead of being just one or zero, it can be both at once. It's in a superposition. It's both zero and, and one at the same time. And every number in between at the same time. It's all the numbers at the same time. Uh, it's the superposition has not collapsed into a zero or a one. It's it's not classical physics. It's quantum physics. So and I mean the superposition is not very intuitive to the human brain. So I'm, so as I say this, I'm it's kind of like I'm trying to explain it to myself because I I my cognitive horizon is limited here. I can't I can't grasp what it means. Um, what superposition actually means. 
I've tried ext extensively to grapple with this con concept, but uh, I'm, but I'm a monkey, so I can't. And that's that's so fascinating to hear that there are like several realities, or we create reality when when we observe things, um, which is also interesting to think. If the many worlds theory is is right, then there are like many many Bitcoin blockchains. Like there, there's maybe even like realities uh, worlds without Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, I it... actually made made a video about this, uh, or, or did I make it? I'm not sure. I have a script at least. I'm not sure if I made a video about it yet. Like just the idea that uh, that <laughs> it's just a fun philosophical idea that Bitcoin may actually be like a break in quantum reality because it it is the one truth through time uh, that doesn't branch, uh, which, uh, which is just a fun thought experiment. Um, it's, not, it's not true, but it, it helps, it gains some perspective on reality and on Bitcoin. Uh, oh, I just oh, wanted to f finish the point with, uh, with quantum computers here. Um, just let me drive on the point uh, real quick. Like, so to maintain this uh, superposition in our quantum computers, the qubits must be extremely cold to prevent anything uh, in their surroundings to move at all. Everything needs to be frozen completely still <laughs> because otherwise the qubits begin to, to interact with their surroundings like um, atoms and particles moving around due to the heat. So we need to freeze every particle, every atom into place for our qubits to work. Uh, so, but nature doesn't need to do that. By the way, I can kind of like identify with these qubits because uh, like on a personal level, they, they seem very autistic and like they have ADHD at the same time. They, they need to be, they need to be uh, in a very calm and quiet place and they're very easily distracted. Nature uh, has found this way to make quantum uh, calculations at room temperature without freezing all the molecules at the same time. Or, or like what, while it's making these calculations. And that's what I mean when I say that no human being understands what photosynthesis actually is or how it works. Um, because nature does quantum calculations at root, room temperatures, and we are nowhere near that at all. That That's really, really fascinating. A lot of new things for me here <laughs> to, yeah. to process. I, I, will, I will have to rewatch that episode myself a lot. <laughs> yeah, is this a Bitcoin episode? I'm not sure. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. And that's the fascinating thing. Um, I have a Bitcoin podcast, this one here, and I talk everyone every day about Bitcoin. But Bitcoin has bring so many different interesting topics uh, uh, to the show where I think I only talk around 40% actually about Bitcoin. So uh, I think most of the show is actually already about something else that touches on Bitcoin because Bitcoin seemingly touches everything. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, my favorite example for that is always, I made with Lisa Huff, um, a whole episode around parenting. Like we, we didn't, I think we maybe talked about, like we, we maybe mentioned the word Bitcoin like four times. Uh, I, I was making an episode with Michael Sale. It was like one and a half hours long. And just for fun, I was searching in my transcript for Bitcoin and it was 205 times in there. Like we, we, we mentioned Bitcoin so many times. It's fascinating. So if, if Bitcoin only comes like three times in an episode, that's a really low number uh, just, <laughs> just to give a perspective. So it's interesting how you can have a Bitcoin podcast and you talk about so many different topics. Imagine doing the same thing when you have like a stock podcast or something like that. You 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 rather stick to your topic, but with Bitcoin, yeah, it doesn't translate. Yeah, with Bitcoin, you can Bitcoin. talk about everything. Also, the audience loves it. I think the audience would be bored of after sometimes is if the only topic would be actually Bitcoin. It's a Bitcoin podcast, but uh, it's 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 good that we touch on different topics, and it, then it's also in, always interesting how those different topics kind of coexists with, with with Bitcoin, for example, with the quantum mechanics where uh, we have the blockchain that <laughs> all of a sudden gives that truth to, to those different realities where it's like, uh, how does that, how does that uh, translate? Or you said like, uh, we, we cannot make ourselves immortal. Uh, and then with Bitcoin, you can transcribe, uh, just inscribe your, your name, uh, you, you can describe transactions 
and make yourself kind of immortal in the in the Bitcoin blockchain. That's that's quite it's kind of fascinating idea. To uh, I think you made a video even about it. Uh, if yeah, if, yeah, if, it's uh, one of my more recent videos. Yeah, yeah, I think I think I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I'm um, I'm on this. Uh, I have this project now. Like I've had this YouTube channel for for years, but I've never really made anything of it. So now I decided to just publish one video a week uh, and giving myself a hard deadline and it's super difficult to make these videos in, in, in just a week, juggling like all the other stuff I have at least. So, um, but so far I'm on week eight now and I'm on schedule to publish a new one um, tomorrow. Uh, and this one is going to be about... Well, again, a bit about human history, but uh, it's a very, very fascinating concept, like uh, how all of recorded human history uh, fits into just 50 generations and like the implications of this. Uh, it's um, I, I was sitting here editing just as we started recording and uh, I'm it's also going to touch a bit on on psychedelics because psychedelics have been so transformative to uh, to our evolution, our development of language, and um, just how how we think and what we think about. Uh, psychedelics have really expanded our cognitive horizons in ways that few other things have. Like the the things that have expanded our uh, cognition to even a similar degree would be like having more calories and starting to use tools and language. So calories, tools, language, and psychedelics are probably the main drivers for our, uh, for the, for the expansion of the human mind. You mentioned, I think in, in a podcast or a video that you see Bitcoin as an economic psych psychedelic. I have a hard yeah, time always. Yeah, uh, yeah it, is. It, it, it is an economic psychedelic. Yeah. How do you mean that? What are the implications of that? I'm actually covering this in the video now that you mentioned it. That's, a fast, that's interesting. Uncanny timing. Bitcoin is it's not just an economic psychedelic. It's, it's a psychedelic period, not a chemical one, but it's a psychedelic in, in a variety of ways. But it has very psychedelic uh, implications for the economy. So one ways, in one way that Bitcoin is a psychedelic is that psychedelic means mind manifesting. So it shows what, what exists within. So psychedelics give you um, an inventory of your mental algorithms. They show you who you are, truly. You cannot close your eyes to the facts about who you are um, in a psychedelic state. They show you all the garbage that you carry within. Uh, they show all the flaws that you carry. and But they also show you everything that's beautiful. Bitcoin <laughs> holds up a mirror to the economy and says, this is all the trash that you have in the economy. Uh, there is, app, you have all these kinds of weird economic algorithms that have become truths because they've just uh, existed for so long. Like we tell, a tr we, ch we tell stories about ourselves and that's what we become, but they are not, we tell stories about ourselves and those stories, uh, we become those stories but they're not necessarily true. And the psychedelics can show us that these stories that we tell ourselves are not true. Like uh, if, you, if you tell yourself that I can never, I could never run a marathon or I can never lose weight or I can never find a partner or I could never write a book. These things become who you are. All of the stories that you have about yourself, they become who you are. Psychedelics show you that these are just stories and that you have the ability to, to reprogram your mind and change the, by changing these stories. Uh, like the difference between a smoker and a non-smoker and someone who's trying to quit is that the, the person who actually quits begins to, they have changed their story. They are no longer a smoker. So you can, there can be a person who has not smoked for 16 months or sorry, this is 16 weird number, six months. And, uh, and still be thinking of themselves as someone who is quitting smoking. And then there can be someone who has just hasn't smoked for a day, but they have made the fundamental 
uh, understanding or um, change within themselves that they are no longer a smoker. One of those two people is going to stay off cigarettes. The other one is not. And it's the one that has changed the story about who they are. And so psychedelics show us all these stories that we carry within and gives us the plasticity to actually change our our mental algorithms. Because if they just showed them to us, it would be kind of pointless. We also need the plasticity to actually make the change. And uh, uh, psychedelics provide that plasticity into the brain. The, the uh, psychedelic state is a hyperplastic hyper-connected state. It's very, very uh, highly entropic. It's a high entropy state, uh, the psychedelic state. Bitcoin, and in, in the same sense that psychedelics expose the flaws that you have within you, in your mind, in your cognitive algorithms, Bitcoin shows the economic algorithms within the fiat system that are just garbage. Like, for example, the idea that we need a state to issue money or control money or mandate inflation. These are stories that we've been telling ourselves and they have become economic reality because we've told them so many times. But it's not true. Um, it's not true. And Bitcoin shows us that it's not true. And it provides the plasticity in the economy for us to actually change this by providing good money, by providing a new economic operating system. It shows us that that money shouldn't be a use for uh, a tool for financial surveillance. It does this by being money that um, that if implemented correctly cannot be used to spy on you. It um, shows us that having weak money makes us weak because it undermines our potential to coordinate and collaborate to the best of our abilities. And that, re that limits the amount of complexity that we can have in society. Bitcoin shows us all of these things and provides the plasticity, plasticity into the economy for us to actually uh, make the changes. So that, that's in one way that Bitcoin is an economic psychedelic. It gives us these grand realizations of what's actually going on and then giving us the, the space and the plasticity to actually make the change. So uh, that's, that's one crucial way that Bitcoin is, uh, is an economic psychedelic. And it's, it's a psychedelic period um, in many other ways because it does the same thing to the economy as it does to you, like other psychedelics do. It exposes, it, it ex, ex, exposes what you have within you. It exposes what kind of time preference you have. It exposes what kind of uh, priorities you make. And it, it gives you the environment, the uh, plasticity, if you will, again, to actually make a change there as well. So now you have the ability to think about the future and save for the future before maybe you couldn't. Like if you go to Argentina or um, a place like that, like they can't save for the future. There's just no, they don't have the ability to save for the future. And if you look at in uh, to El Salvador before uh, it was Bitcoinized, like everything was very fleeting. Money was fleeting, life was fleeting. So people spent just everything as quickly as they could. There was no people, when you have this broken money that just evaporates as soon as you touches it, there's no reason to save it. You can't save it. There's no meaning to it. So that means that you spend it right now. You spend it as quickly as possible and you don't use it to build a future. If you look back 2000 years when we had a hard money, when we had the denarius, when we used the gold and silver money, we see, their, we see it in their architecture. We see it in their plays. We see it in their writing. We see it in their uh, political systems. We see it in how money really is a, a mental operating system that governs our time preference. And time preference is everything. Time preference isn't just about, uh, should I eat ice cream today or not? It, it's about, should we become a spacefaring civilization, a, a multiplanetary spacefaring civilization and, and uh, create longevity, escape velocity um, type of a civilization? Uh, those kinds of decisions are at stake. Because when we are in a, when we're entrenched in a fiat system where money erodes, we are not at, we cannot coordinate to the extent that we need 
uh, because we're just we spend the money as soon as as we get it. We are not building for the future, and the money doesn't qualify. It doesn't have the ability to create a complex coordination across time and space, which is needed if you want to have complexity in society and for us to continue to evolve and become a spacefaring multiplanetary species. We're not going to do that under a fiat system, but we, but we will under a Bitcoin system. That's a beautiful realization. I, I think we, we kind of went really quickly to the end of the <laughs> of the end of this podcast. Uh, it, it flew away the time, um, but I think that's a it's a really beautiful end uh, um, to, to to end it with. Um, I have a, two end routines uh, in the podcast where the first question is always the same question for each guest, uh, and I usually ask, "What can we learn from you besides Bitcoin?" But I will ask you. Uh, what can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about in this podcast? I like to do a lot of things. I'm not sure that I am the greatest teacher of anything, but what I'm very good at, is I'm very good at having good experiences and living life. Like there, there are some experiences that are truly, truly expansive and like unfathomable. And I like to go into these places and I think I'm, pretty good at helping people get there as well to have deeper experiences. I, there are so many people who have anxiety, who go through life having some resistance to what is, have resistance to life. What we need to do is just quiet the mind and open, open our hearts, quiet the mind and open the hearts. How do we quiet the mind? We meditate. How do we open our hearts? We just find an ember of love and focus on that thing and feel that love intensely, uh, whether it's for just for your breath, for being alive, for a sibling, for a parent, for a child, for a pet, find some kind of ember and, and feel that love intensely and then let it expand. And when you get good at expanding the feeling of love, um, you can expand it to encompass the entire universe and you love everything about the human experience, the good and the bad, the whole spectrum. And that is the only way to live life. This is something that I want to, this is a journey, um, like my spiritual journey is the most important thing to me in my life. And I want to bring as many people along as possible to a more awakened state. So. That is something that is very important to me right now. And that is something uh, that I think that I have to offer other people. Beautiful. I like it a lot. Uh, I think it's could be hard to to offer it to other people, but, I, but probably it's possible. I, I like the thought a lot. They're really cool. Um, the other intro of the podcast is where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest oh. with, without knowing who the next guest actually is. Uh, and the previous guest asked you the question, is it important uh, to separate Bitcoin from political views? If so, why or why not? Especially in an election year, kind of <laughs> relevant. Well, <laughs> that's a good question and a, a super cool thing that you do in your podcast. I like that. That's uh, cool. Uh, cool that you had that. Um, so uh, two thoughts here. First, uh, Bitcoin hunted badger doesn't care. Doesn't matter. <laughs> it really doesn't. It really doesn't. But uh, then that's uh, that's the short and true answer. Like the whole thing with having uh, party politics is is not. It's um, what's the word? It's a new phenomenon, and it's not always going to be like this. We're not always going to have politics in the same way that we do now. It's a fleeting occurrence. And in 400 years, it's going to be radically different. We're going, to, we're going to be organizing ourselves in much more sophisticated ways than we are right now. Like it wasn't that long ago uh, that we had a feudal system with kings and queens and peasants and stuff. We have a better way of organizing ourselves now. And this is, uh, this is by no means the end of the evolution of how humans organize themselves. But right now, it's, it's our reality. And Bitcoin is going to be on the uh, political agenda. 
it's inevitable. And this is my second thought that like we are going to have passed through quite a few stepping stones that are just like ETF inevitable. It's, it's going to happen. It's on the way to Bitcoinization of the economy. We cannot Bitcoinize the economy without going through these steps and hurdles. But there are going to be battles with the state. There, there is an ongoing war on privacy, uh, perhaps the most important uh, war in Bitcoin's history makes the uh, block uh, size wars look uh, like uh, like a snowball fight. So there are all of these like inevitable stepping stones that we are going to witness on the road to a hyper bitcoinized economy. I mean, we're not going to uninstall the fiat system and install the bitcoin system without some uh, challenges because we can't we can't uh, uninstall the fiat system and just pause the world and then install bitcoin it's going to happen in parallel it's a transition and through that transition we will see it become a political issue and i mean it's it's entertaining it's unimportant honey badger doesn't care and it's an in- inevitable stepping stone to the future very true um and uh, I like the two sides of the, of it, uh, which also gives the realistic side on, of the reality, and but still the the vision of Bitcoin. Really cool. And um, before I let you go, um, where can people uh, find you and 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 uh, ask you questions if they want to reach out to you or uh, find your book or find your videos? Yeah, so I am on YouTube, Yoni Appleberg, I O N I Appleberg. Uh, not like an apple like you eat, but A-P-P-E-L-B-E-R-G. Um, Yoni Appleberg on YouTube. I make uh, like philosophical Bitcoin content mostly, uh, but I'm probably expanding into other areas as well and talking about like psychedelics and stuff and cool technology and everything that I just find fascinating, like aliens and future civilization, uh, the future of humanity and stuff. Uh, so that's on my YouTube. Uh, I'm also widely available on Twitter, X, Yoni Appleberg as well. And if you want to get a copy of my book, Abundance Through Scarcity, it's a, it's a very, very good book. Uh, I'm super proud to have my name on it. You can find it on Amazon and on uh, Bitcoin Book Dutch. Thank you so much for taking the time, Yoni. Uh, thank you type time. <laughs> thank you for, for taking your time. And also thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening, uh, for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.